and um, I'll give people a, a second to still be coming online, but uh, it's intentionally um, maybe a little bit out there and a little bit untraditional. And if 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 uh, if we accomplish the goal of maybe having you stop and think about how you um, execute your your projects, I, I will consider it a success. So we'll get ready to roll here now. So. Um, basically, I just want to talk a little bit about this topic of early synergy, where I'm headed with that. I'll tell you just briefly, I've got just a couple of slides uh, that tell you a little bit about Benchmark because, you know, we've got people from such a variety of, of places on, on the call here this morning. And then we'll get into the more meat of the matter. But uh, first of all, this whole idea, you know, of early, early synergy and especially when it comes to this particular audience, you know, I, you know, you guys aren't seeing each other necessarily. Uh, but when I saw the participant list, I really wish we had all traveled um, to, to Benchmark's offices and I had you all together in a, in a conference room. I'd probably lock the door so we could uh, um, not let you out for a couple of days. But so I'm gonna maybe hit, hit the tip of the iceberg here a little bit in this format but I would surely love to have further input, further discussion. I'd love to know your thoughts. Um, we do have a, if you highlight your taskbar, you'll see the Q&A highlighted. Um, so at the end of this session, um, or even throughout the session, please um, hit that Q&A and be submitting your questions at the end. We'll try and cover as many of those as we can. But even after the session, I would love to continue uh, this this topic and this discussion because it I I believe it's a it's one of those areas that doesn't get enough attention and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go but uh, one of my partners here at Benchmark is fond of using the phrase bring the brains to the game and today you know we've got people um, you know representing such a broad variety of of companies and types of companies. We've got people from the public sector, school systems. We've got people representing industrial and commercial clients. We have roofing contractors. We have roofing manufacturers. We have people from the design and general construction environments. Um, so, and obviously there's a pretty good size uh, benchmark contingent as well. So it's like, um, if we could, if we were successful bringing the brains to the game, um, I'm sure that we could take what I'm going to present here and even take it further. Um, because again, I admit this is some some uh, early thinking, and uh, so again, I'd look forward to your input and, and be submitting Q and A um, as we go. So here we go, and I'm gonna admit that uh, and probably have a little bit of a benchmark reputation to being a reader. And uh, um, I just wanted to open with this. And it kind of gives you a clue about where I'm headed with this whole thing. Uh, but be patient. Hang in there with me. Um, but this, this is a book. And I don't necessarily read a lot of books. But the ones that I do, I, I dwell on them. I, and I maybe I even beat people up with them a little bit. But uh, this is a book. This is a book that uh, probably makes my top five of all time. Uh, it's called *The Boys in the Boat* by Daniel James Brown, and it highlights the story of the 1936 um, Olympic rowing team. They actually came from the University of Washington. They were um, maybe maybe you'd call it the bad news bears. They were not prima donnas. They were they were a, a group of misfits that came together and really accomplished a, an incredible um, experience, a story that changed the world, perhaps. I think it's probably one of the best stories of teamwork all time. So that's enough about the book, but let me read this quote. So many of them, again, them being the boys from the University of Washington that ended up, you know, spoiler alert, they end up winning the Olympics in Berlin under the watchful eye of um, Adolf Hitler. Um, it was not set up for them to win, but many, of, so I'll go, start again. Many of them would never forget the day. For them, it was a dawning, the real hint of hope. If there was, a, if there was little they could do individually to turn the situation around, perhaps there was something they could do collectively. Therein lies what we're talking about today. 
the difference between individual and collective performance. So perhaps the seeds of redemption lie, not just in perseverance, hard work, and rugged individualism. Perhaps they lay in something more fundamental, the simple notion of everyone pitching in and pulling together. So pulling together, that's that's pretty good theme for today. So let's roll. So I'm going to put it in the context of a construction uh, phasing plan. And so, um, and I borrowed this or kind of um, boiled this down from a couple of our clients that have ways that they go about um, approaching construction. And in this case, the client labels them with numbers. So phase zero all the way to phase seven. Phase seven, uh, or excuse me, phase zero is where that project just really, the whole idea of the project is hatched. And we want to figure out, or they want to figure out, does this um, venture fit the vision? So is there any kind of alignment? And if we put it in a roofing context, or and I would say that I believe this applies to all types of construction. At Benchmark, we think of roofing and paving projects. But it, I think it applies to even just problem solving, to, to think of uh, the origination. Does it fit the vision? You know, you, then you kind of, okay, yes. It must be a yes for it to go on to phase one, where we start thinking about, okay, what the heck problem are we trying to solve here? and get then to phase two, where we're trying to uh, I'll get some early scope de uh, definition and moving into phase three project planning. All of that is really, if you put it in an, maybe an architectural sense, more programming, trying to align uh, what we're trying to do with this project with the client objectives. Uh, here at Benchmark, we talk a lot about the idea that we don't want to just hit the target. We want to hit the bullseye, so the center of it. And as you go along, you, you tend to refine your sights and get a little bit closer to what that means. So then, you know, we get closer to actually going to market. You know, does, uh, phase four, detailed procurement, or excuse me, de detailed design. That's where plans and specifications arrive on the scene. We figured out what to specify and we start putting it into a concrete form such that it can be purchased. And then phase five is, is actual construction. And so both, maybe phase four is the beginnings of execution, but it's really in phase five uh, where we have construction companies and materials, all of that coming together to go build. And then you have um, phases six and seven, where you close out successfully and post audit, or you know we call it an autopsy, where you're trying to apply lessons learned. But it's within phase five. Um, and I think every client on this call today has potential different phasing plans or approaches to how you, how you um, get to the point of building roof and pavement systems. But then, you know, if we really just pause at phase five, we got to, you know, figure out um, how to do that successfully. And I'm here, I'm kind of of the contention today that this is as complex of an environment as we've ever encountered. And I'm just a little past 40 years in this business. And I'm just going to say that I think it's the most complex environment for executing construction in my career. So I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna just use that as kind of the basis for what, why I feel like this topic of, I named it early synergy. And that will come uh, to light a little bit in terms of what I mean with that and why I think it's important, what its potential benefits are. And it's within that phase five that most of it applies but it's important that we realize the importance of everything that led up to phase five, phase five as well. So here we go. I'm going to tell you just a couple of briefs because some of you are actually new to Benchmark. So I don't want to um, leave it to guess here in terms of who the heck are we? So Benchmark, we're uh, just real quick, roof and pavement consultants. That's our niche. That's what we do. Uh, we've, we were established a little over 40 years ago. 
1983, actually for the single purpose of managing a large roof replacement program. It was our very first client. It took us uh, from coast to coast and even beyond um, for that first roof management program. So we're um, an independent, privately owned corporation. Um, we're, you know, the, it, there's a group of employees and leaders at Benchmark that own the company. Um, so we, uh, we've been working on succession planning and have a really strong leadership and ownership team in place. Um, our office is in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. That's our corporate office and roofing division. And then our paving division is in wa uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin. And in addition to that, we have 29 satellite locations, basically employee-based um, home office locations with a total employment of 118. So what do we do? Uh, basically, it could boil it down to these few areas. Evaluations of existing assets. That's roof or pavement systems where the result of our work is a written report. We also help then on projects, which we're here to talk about today. The design and bidding aspect of roof uh, or um, pavement replacement projects, repair projects, um, occasionally new construction projects, and then construction phase services. Uh, program management is where we take, um, and many of our clients are in this um, kind of realm where they have a fleet of buildings, and it isn't just a single viewpoint or a single facility. It's uh, a wide, you know, array of buildings, maybe spread across a, a wide geography with various buildings and um, roof types, pavement types, and we help them in terms of, uh, call it a fleet management approach. And uh, UAV, as mentioned here, is, is certainly a growing and uh, interesting service uh, that we're incorporating into everything above. <clears throat> so our core values, I want to mention these because I think it ties off to what we're here uh, to accomplish today. So to be a strong team based on relationships and trust. So we have three core values, this being the first one, strong team uh, based on relationships and trust. Uh, be really committed to being technically excellent. And I must say, okay, we've been in business a little over 40 years. We're very dedicated to technical excellence. And I just got to tell you, part of, part of the reason we are is we've learned a lot of lessons. We've made some mistakes. We've had, you know, projects go bad. We've had roofs that didn't work <laughs> the way that they were intended. So scar tissue exists. And we just feel like within the realm of benchmark, uh, we're uh, we're not huge risk takers. Okay, we want to provide solutions that are technically excellent. It's part of being a benchmark. And really, if you boiled it all down to two words, it's about relationships, and maybe this is three words: relationships and proven results. Relationships, results. So I'll tie off to that a little bit further. But that's what we're here and here for and it's even why i'm here today because i want to help promote some thinking around the idea that uh, relationships especially when you're working in uh, multiple facility situations it's not a single purchase once every 15 or 20 years that you're going to buy a roof no you're going to be this is an ongoing endeavor so you need relationships ongoing suppliers and vendors that that can help you uh, deliver reliable results. So I think there's some alignment between what, you know, certainly the purpose of today and really what this purpose of benchmark is in is period. So here's a formula that I'm borrowing. I made some slight ad adaptations to it, but I'll give credit where credit is due. This, this once again came out of a book. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a book written by Stephen M. Covey, not S Stephen R. Covey, the uh, the author of um, uh, Seven High Habits of Highly Effective Pe People. This is his son, and he wrote a book called Speed of Trust, and he highlights this formula, and I changed it just a little bit, but I'm going to still give him credit for that, and it's a real common way of thinking is that strategy plus execution equals results. If we just have that right vision for our projects, for our construction projects, for our roof construction projects. So a good vision. We did all that architectural type programming from, from the very beginning, origination, uh, through the programming steps, trying to figure out exactly what we want. 
it's a good, we have a good strategy. And then if we have good execution, you know, things like processes, we have, um, you know, ability to handle problems when they come up, we've got a good operating system. Those, those, so it, it's a lot of, um, we're all guilty perhaps of thinking if we have the right strategy, if we have the right execution, we'll get good results. But um, what Stephen highlighted in his book is that there's a hidden variable. It's not just strategy plus execution. There's this multiplier called trust. And I'll just back up. Whether you realize it or not, that T exists in that formula. It's You don't see it, but it's there. So again, strategy plus execution times trust equals results. So trust is a multiplier. And there's when I say that that T exists, whether you realize it or not, there, just think there could be different kinds of trust, different levels of trust. There could be no trust. There could be blind trust. There could be distrust. Have you ever been in a situation like that where the parties, they came together and uh, they didn't trust each other right off the bat? Distrust. There was no earned trust. Or And it, likewise, if you have what we're going to call smart trust, then some magic can happen. I'm just going to say that that trust is truly a multiplier for good. So if you look at this matrix on the vertical axis, we're measuring the propensity to trust. Certainly, when we come together, uh, we want to have an attitude or a spirit about us that is, you know, we're inclined to trust. We will lean into one another. We will attempt to trust one another. But we're not blind. Let's look at that horizontal axis, the, the analysis. We're going to do some due diligence. We're going to, hey, you do have to prove it to me a little bit before I'm going to give you my trust. And, you know, I, I just added it up the other day uh, as I was preparing for this. I took a project. I took an actual project. And it, um, in today's day and age, maybe not even what would be considered a big project. So it was about a million dollar roof replacement project. And I added up all of the people involved with the project. I went all, all the way from the, the client level, uh, which had a corporate entity. It had a local facility or plant um, level people. It had, obviously we brought two or three or four people as you know consultant involved in the project. The roofing contractor brought about 25 people. The, the roofing manufacturer had a, a small team of people that were in, involved in the project. Um, and then, interestingly, the contractor didn't just bring his own forces. He brought subcontracted services to the table. So all told, that 40 people that were on or had some uh, touch of that project represented eight different companies. It's like, tell me that when we all come together for phase five, you know, I, call, I showed you that that phasing plan. We're down here in five, phase five. We're getting ready to execute. And now we got 40 people representing eight different companies. And we expect magic to happen. And we, many of us are getting to know each other for the first time. So man, we got to figure out a way to not only uh, go deep with our trust, we got to do it fast. So Hopefully we can shed some light on that today and get some early thinking going. And again, that's where I'm going to need you guys. We got a lot of brains in this audience. So fire up that Q&A. Let, let me know what you're thinking. Even if it's not a question, you might say, Ron, you are crazy. You know, it's like, no, I've, I'm going to go a little further. Hopefully it connects uh, with, your, with your thoughts. But I'd love to hear what you're thinking. Is this important to you? Do you believe in what I'm saying? So let's uh, let's keep moving. And I'm going to give one more author some credit here. This is Patrick Lencioni. He's uh, there's probably two authors at Benchmark that have meant uh, that we've been reading about and studying um, since, you know, for over 30 years. So that being Jim Collins and his series of books, Built to Last being the first that we read. And then Patrick Lencioni here. And you might recognize this 
we actually learned of this pyramid of organizational health through one of his books called The Advantage. And uh, you might also recognize it is because it's the same concept, the same layers to this pyramid came out of his book, probably a more famous book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And um, we adapted it a little bit. We added two legs to the triangle that we called grace and forgiveness and the other being respect. And uh, I guess uh, that's important here at Benchmark because like I said, right off the bat, we've, we've made some mistakes. Um, and thankfully we've had some clients uh, that have come right alongside us with those. And we've learned together. Uh, we didn't trash the relationship. We, we moved forward. But it, you know, in this day and age, it's really important that we do have grace and respect. Um, I don't want to skip over that because um, you know, the roofing workforce that arrives on our sites today, it looks different than it, it's ever looked. But I think if we respect those people, it will go a long ways to build, building organizational health. So I, I want to just, when we think of the layers, trust, and, you know, if we put it in the five dysfunctions team, uh, five dysfunctions of a team language, it'd say the lack of trust turns into an inability or fear to handle conflict. We can't even argue. We're, we're walking on eggshells. We're avoiding, we're biting our lip. Or maybe we're talking about each other behind our back because we don't have the courage. We don't have the trust to handle conflict, handle problems when they arrive. Man, is that important. When we're building roofs over operating facilities, it's difficult. So we've got to have the ability to do conflict. When we lack that ability, it leads to, therefore, low commitment. People are fearful of accountability, and there's a general inattentiveness to results. Nobody's really paying attention. So it, I'm just going to say that organizational health um, really is a combination. It's both of these things. It's a combination of smart, and a lot of times benchmark, we concentrate on the smart. We're being, we're being asked to bring intelligence uh, our ability to help people sort out the building code and the complexity of a project and put together good documents. But have we really paid enough attention to the healthy? And when I say healthy, that it's summarized in this pyramid here. We've, I think we've leaned to the left there. We've not really paid enough attention to the right. So I just wanna um, impress upon you and uh, this is a little bit of another run adaptation, but this kind of an unusual quad chart when you think that the horizontal axis and the vertical axis are both measuring the same thing, value. And it's like, okay, you know what? Don't you want to be of high value? Don't you want to have the most impact you can for your employer? <laughs> it might even turn into more money. You know, it's like, so perception of value by your own employer. I want you to be you know, of high value. I want you to learn something today that increases your value. And then the marketplace is also on the, maybe the other axis. It's gonna put a value on that. So I just want you to realize that, the, I mean, we can't do away with transactions. I'm not shedding negative light on that, but it's not up and to the right. There's more than one place um, in our world that I, I, want, I want to move our thinking up and to the right, high value. And when it comes to teamwork, teamwork is not a virtue. Teamwork is a choice. And I want us to think about teamwork in our construction projects as being not just a, um, you know, optional approach, let's hope it happens, no, it ought to be part of our strategy that we're trying to initiate, certainly allow for it, sponsor it, stir it up, do what it takes. It's not a virtue. People aren't born with it. It's a strategic choice. And I'm here to say it's of high value. So, I, you know, I mentioned we've got a little scar tissue. We've got some, some lessons learned that, you know, it's like, where do you learn the most? 
on projects that just went perfectly? Or do you learn maybe uh, more lessons out of those that didn't go quite so well? And this, this, uh, this, this is, I've, you know, removed all the names. And so there's no breach of confidentiality. I'm not going to name any names. I'm not going to throw any company under the bus or any person under the bus, but I'm going to own it too, okay? I want to take some responsibility here. On the right side, you've got a detail that was included in a specification for our project. And it was a and it was a large project. It was north of $10 million project. And then over on the left, uh, there was this tiny little roof that was to be completed. I mean, tiny at the end of the job. It was so small and inconsequential that that we didn't even uh, observe its completion. We we just said, you know what? We'll come back for the final inspection, and uh, and then when we get there, we see that the the contractor didn't build the liquid applied flashing detail at the structural um, framing. They put a pitch pan instead. And then, by golly, um, refused to change it because they said, but I don't have to do that to get the warranty. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, why do you think the warranty is at the center of the bullseye? And to make matters worse, the roofing manufacturer's tech rep came out onto the job and says, well, you don't have to do that to get the warranty. So I went back to the project, some of that phase, all the way from phase zero to phase four, before phase five. It's like, and we, part of our um, kind of typical procedure, one of our processes here at Benchmark is that before we write a spec, we've, we've done what we call a design review summary. So the design review summary takes all of the parameters that we have come to understand that are important to the client before we decide what to specify. So just look at this. We go all the way from just the very introduction, the project description and history, the conditions that are existing on this existing building. And then, okay, what are we gonna do with the roof replacement? We are going to look at um, the building code. That's a start point. Every spec we write has to follow the building code. Energy code, wind, fire, hail, um, insurance requirements, service life, oh, there's the warranty requirement. What, what does the client want for a warranty? Then we looked at safety, you know, uh, interior protection because we're over an operating facility, obsolete equipment, chemical exhaust. You guys can read them. Vapor design, we had a lot of issues with vapor on this project. And then we go tie off to some corporate objectives. So it's not even a roofing objective, it's a higher level objective. This client wants to, um, they get points. They give themselves a rating when it comes to energy efficiency and the potential for power production on the roof, solar. You know, could that be done or not? Durability, life cycle management, materials management, water management, innovation. All of those factors went into the programming, the vision for the project before we decide what to specify. So the warranty, frankly, was not at the center of the bullseye. But the reason that I highlight this is that, and I know I got to own it, is that did I do a good job explaining not only uh, what we want done, but why do we want it done? It looks to me like we were a little bit guilty of being smart but not paying enough attention to being healthy. So again, what we do and how we do it is, okay, that, that specific you know, location tells you what we want done. Those drawings, they show what, how we want it done, but did we take the time to explain why we did, why? And I'm, I'm just um, convicted of that because it's like, we can do better there. So it's one technique is we're trying to build trust with this group of strangers that just came together to go build a million dollar or maybe a $10 million project for everyone to take a moment and explain the why. So I, <clears throat> part, of, part of our thinking these days is that um, oftentimes this, call it deterioration curve, emphasizes lifespan. 
you know, hey, if we do everything right, we'll make that asset, we'll make that roof or that pavement system last as long as possible. But I think it's also important, and this this graphic has some dynamics to it. So I, it's like we can we also need to think about health span, you know, and putting in a little bit of a personal health type analogy. You know, they have the ability to help us live a long time these days. But it's like, you know, it might flatten out, that curve might flatten out at the end. And, you know, Lord forbid you're laying in a vegetative state for five years, you know, even though they can keep you alive. Well, we want our roofs to not only last a long time, but we want them to be in the proper health. So if I think of this uh, variable here being con the condition variable, what if this is a, a, a really important occupancy? So you can see this line is moving up. I need, this is more important than a just a um, dry warehouse that maybe even partially um, obsolete or, you know, not filled. But this this is a really important roof. Let's even bump it up to the 80% condition. We need 80% condition to consider that roof to be healthy enough for the client's risk parameters, their, their serviceability requirements. So it's like, okay, um, in a normal deterioration curve, which I'm calling commodity approach, the red line, average service life in the low slope roofing marketplace today is is about 17 years, which by the way, I think is a little paltry, but um, so that probably is a you know moderate to low quality roof or maybe even normal roof quality when it's first installed. Um, and but where does it intersect that acceptable service line? So we're starting to pay attention to not just life, but health. Where do we want that roof and a desired time frame to be health wise? And how we build the roof initially has a lot to do with, so our success of our projects have a lot to do with how healthy it will be and for how long. And we could probably talk for an hour on this slide, I'll keep on moving though. So <clears throat> I wanted to reflect again, back to the kind of benchmark approach. And, um, you know, when, when we're, um, when I'm meeting with the benchmark leadership and I've done this for years now, and it, I, I just admit it makes some of our leaders cringe when they know that we're gonna do this. But at a leadership team level, and I borrowed this from, that book or um, The Advantage by Patrick Lencioni, we'll ask each other, we'll go around the room, and this is a group of people that know each other. We'll ask questions like, where were you born? How many siblings do you have? Where did you appear in the birth order? What was an interesting um, or difficult challenge that you encountered in life? I had another leader give me what he calls the four H's, and we've done these at our last um, at our last board meeting, it's like, tell me about your, your history, your heroes, your hardships, and what your hopes in life are. And it's like, it's, and I'll tell you what, it works every time. It works every time. I learned something about the people, and these are people that I know well. I learned something about them. So just imagine what happens when we take this group of 40 or 50 people, and we're going to go build a complex roof. If we actually work on developing trust early as part of the equation. So this, this uh, droplet here is representing the ripples in a pond and how there's waves of trust. And the only thing we're going to dwell with today and just touch on as I roll towards the conclusion is what's called self-trust. We won't even get to relational or organizational market or societal trust. But if you think about it, when we're building projects, we've got to get to at least organizational trust and alignment, not just of individuals, but of companies, which is difficult. It, when I think of how hard we work on being not just smart, but healthy, it takes effort, takes intentionality. So we're going to just work around the horn on the concept of self-trust, because frankly, it all starts with you. 
It starts with me. It starts with some, let's put, use it as a tree analogy, integrity. It, it, and, you know, the, the trunk of the tree is our intentions and then our capabilities. And we all want fruit. That's that, you know, everybody wants the top of the pyramid, right? They just want results. But let's talk about how to get there. So integrity, intent being the trunk, capabilities, the branches, you know, and then the results, the fruit of our efforts. So let's take it a little bit at a time. So what does integrity mean? So we've got to have no gaps. That means no gaps between how you behave and what your motives are and your intentions are. Humility, I think that's really an interesting one. We had a contractor just this last week visit our office and he was being highly complimentary. And, he, and someone in um, on our team asked him a fairly pointed question, asked him, now, when you say that, what is it you're actually getting after about Benchmark that you think um, separates us a bit? And the answer was, and this is one of the largest roofing contractors in the country. He said, ego. And it just, man, it, I think it caused everyone to stop and think. Humility has such a good place. We make mistakes, but we've 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 got to have enough um, that we're we're not so concerned about being right as we are doing right, and then have the courage. I think that ties off to the uh, ability to do conflict and handle those relationships well. So over on intent, that trunk of the tree, what are our motives? Have you ever dealt with someone and you really suspected they have hidden agenda? That doesn't help, does it? So care. Do you care about these others? Do you care about the people? Do you have respect for those roofing crew people that are coming to build my roof? Do you respect them? And how we go about leading them is really important. So that bottom half, the bottom half of this quadrant chart is talking about our character. And the top half is talking about our competence, you know, our talent, our skills, our knowledge, even our style. And then over on the right side, the, hey, results, they do matter. And, you know, one of the things about results is it feeds a flywheel. When we accomplish complex and difficult projects together, we develop clout, we develop trust. So trust is both a noun and a verb. But when we do it, then we accomplish it. And all of a sudden we got more of it. And then it turns into the next one and, and the flywheel gains momentum. So mission accomplished. But I think draw that, that really interesting distinction in your mind between competence and character. Because I think if I would ask the audience early, if you guys, if I just say, hey, do you trust me? Maybe, maybe you would have said yes. I don't know what the results of that question would be. But it's like, well, what if I ask a different question? Do you trust me to do your knee surgery? It's like, no. So my character has nothing to do with your overall trust. So we've got to bring character. That's healthy. We've got to bring confidence. That's smart. So skills, the right specs, you know, all of that. But we also got to bring intent, our, uh, our character, that humility, you know, with no hidden agenda to the mix. So this is where the idea that I, I think I just want to add time to the equation. When we, we look at that diminishing curve of our ability to influence the success of a project, it's greater early. And I didn't add the phases to this, to this line graph, but if, if you think of uh, phase five over there on, you know, when we're actually going to construction, it's like, um, maybe at the intersection of these two red lines, our ability to influence the success has been diminished. And likewise, the chances of the cost of implementing any changes that might be necessary starts to increase. So when I say early synergy, one plus one equals three. When we take different people, different companies, we bring them together and we have synergy. We take advantage of this, each other's strengths and we compensate for each other's weaknesses. And I'm just here to say the earlier we do that, the more impact that we can have. 
So early uh, collaboration and trust creates early synergy. So I'm kind of advising just really practically, we don't wanna just have this group of strangers show up with absolutely no idea of what went into phases zero through four. We want them to be aware. So do, the, do them the favor. And then let's work on trust as part of our overall approach to the project. So I love these, these arrows. It's like when trust is high, speed is high and cost is low. But the inverse is also true that when trust is low, speed is low and cost goes up. Not a desirable aspect. So this is one of my favorites. Um, this is Alan Mulally, who was the former CEO of both Boeing and Ford Motor Company. And his quote, leadership is having a compelling vision, comprehensive plan, relentless implementation, and talented people working together. So talented people, they're smart and they're working together. They're healthy, smart, healthy. And if you think about it, and I didn't show a graph of what's happened to Ford Motor Company after Alan became CEO. And keep in mind, Alan didn't know beans about making cars. His, he was, you know, avionics guy. Um, but what he did, he brought two pieces of paper with him from Boeing to Ford Motor Company, and they're called his working together model. And it's interesting. I've seen them. They have hearts on them. <laughs> it's like, really? You got to be kidding me. I thought you had to be a tough guy to run Ford Motor Company. And that was his emphasis, working together. So I hope that uh, maybe I planted some seeds here today, that it's like, yeah, we need good specs. We need good processes, leave no doubt. We need good talent, but we also need healthy and, uh, and working together as part of our equation. And with that, we'll accomplish early synergy and we'll be moving up and to the right. That strategic decision to not, not a virtue, a decision for teamwork. That's the goal. So just picture yourself sitting at the table at your next project. And I don't know what role you're in. We could just cover the map with all of the participants in this little webinar. You know, are you, are you safety and compliance representing the client? Are you an outside designer, a material supplier? Now, are you representing procurement? Contracts, legal. Oh, you're the contractor and you're bringing a group of subs to the project. Are you? And then we got to maintain this thing after we build it, by the way. But it's like, if we think of ourselves, not just as having this strategic model of smart pieces, but we're sitting at the table together and we're going to try to work on teamwork and be healthy as part of the equation. So keep in mind, whether you know, you know, you, you put it on the table or not, trust is at the table. It could be distrust, no trust, or it can be smart trust. Smart trust is what we want to see happen. And I hope you learned something today that helps you develop that trust, take it to a new level, and work together. So one last thing, I just want to invite you to come to Benchmark. I don't care who you are, if, you know. This is our office. If anything, it, it illustrates that we're a consultant. We can't make up our mind. We have 14 different roof systems on our building. So we'd love to engage you. You can borrow our conference room even. Uh, but uh, come to visit Benchmark. We look forward to meeting you, advancing our relationship, and hopefully building trust. So at that point, I'll just take some questions. OK, so a couple have come in. Um, how do you define stakeholders? How do you, with so many um, different aspects of um, different entities that are out there, how do you say they can define the stakeholders in their project? Well, I think a stakeholder in my mind, you know, you might think of it at, at different levels, but a stakeholder is anybody that has an influence on the project, an influence on the successful outcome of the project. And then, you know, you might take it up a, a notch or two when you say, you know, who is ultimately responsible? Who owns? You know, I love the, love the idea that Jordan or anybody associated with the project owns it. 
and they may own a specific piece of it, but they're not just representing that piece as a faction. They're representing it knowing that it fits in a strategic model and that it's important that all the pieces work together. Okay. And you mentioned subcontractors. Um, are they represented or by the main contractor or should they also be included up front in all the discussions? You know, I think uh, um, the roofing contracting world is taking a, a, a different look these days. And I think it's a little bit more of a general contract look to it. And it may, you know, you're going to have to just use your noggin when it comes to the the, the timing of it, uh, when subs are brought in to, you know, brought to the table, maybe the, the prime contractor, the prime roofing contractor is, um, you know, and, and some of it depends on the nature of the requirements of bidding. When I think of this audience that we have today, you've got school systems that have to go through a public bidding uh, arena, and you have other private or industrial clients that, um, you know, would have different requirements for bidding. So we can't, you know, necessarily um, alleviate those or eliminate those, but uh, depending, I just say earlier, the better for all, okay? It's like, and then just don't skip steps. And, and what, here's a rule of thumb. When you have a new team member, you have a new team. Mm -hmm. So if all of a sudden you just brought this, uh, maybe a sub of, of 10 or 12 men, or, men and women that just arrived on the site, it's like, okay, new team member. That means we got a new team. We go back, you know what? I mentioned our leadership team here at Benchmark. When we have a new team member join, we go through those same list of questions again. The board of directors that I mentioned to you, we went through the four H's at our meeting in March. We had just done that in October, but we had had two new board members elected. So we went right back through it again. So new team member, new team. Go back through the vision. Go back through what's important. Bring them up to speed. Show them respect. And I know it takes time, but it pays off. Okay. Uh, someone's asking, what year did you implement EOS system into your organization and what motivated this decision? Having using EOS for the past seven years, I understand that it can be challenging to get everyone on board, even when you know the system is effective. How have you managed to ensure buy-in from all? Holy cow, that's a, that's a question, man. EOS. So for those of you that don't know, EOS stands for Entrepreneurial Operating System. And uh, we started running on EOS and we had a couple of uh, spits and starts to start with, but I think it was about 2021. So we're really kind of fully th year three or four. Um, and I, I think we have been successful in implementing it. And I'm going to say we implemented it throughout the company. I refused to have an operating system for the leadership of Benchmark and a different operating system for uh, for everyone else. No, we have one operating system. And uh, so we've worked our tails off, I'll tell you that, on implementation. It was, it was twice as hard as I thought it'd be, I'll admit, admit that. But we're really pleased, really pleased. Definitely see a flywheel effect. And I'm really thankful to, because it was at a uh, within a roofing community that I even learned about EOS. But uh, I want to also, for those that are familiar with EOS, there's six key components of EOS, and they commonly refer to it as a, you know, in a, in a pie chart. And so the six key components are vision, uh, people, um, data at the top half. The bottom half is um, issues. How do you handle problems? Do you have good processes? and then what they call traction or kind of your meeting cadence, things like that. But it's, so in some respects, the top half of that pie chart is strategy. The bottom half of that pie chart is execution. So strategy plus execution equals results. But remember, trust has to be part of it. Otherwise it's just an operating system. But we can multiply the results 
if and I've kind of started illustrating it with trust being at the center, at the core of that pie chart. Okay. How do you ensure that the detailed design phase accurately captures all stakeholder requirements and expectations? Well, I think part of our experience hopefully allows that, but uh, you know, we do t t you know kind of pick every project apart before you put it together. So we're going to look. We're, you know, we get quite physical. We we tear walls apart uh, in our due diligence. We you know we're inside the building. We're on top of the building. We're you know looking at the roof from various vantage points. But then we're talking and asking a lot of questions. Um, you know, because we don't want to design for our benefit. It's for the client's benefit. And it needs to not just hit the target, it needs to hit that bullseye. So it takes discernment. And I have, I have, in fact, I have a little bit of, I don't know if you can see this post-it note. I have a post-it note on my wall. It's like, the more you know, the harder it is to listen. And I'm, man, that just puts me down on my knees. It's like, we have to be careful that we don't design for our benefit. We bring all our experience to the table, all of our knowledge, skill, but still we got to go into listening mode because our clients are going to have different goals. And even a wall detail, you might do you might do a wall detail differently for a client that has really high requirements for condition and really long life. Likewise, you may have a client that has lesser goals so you don't have to design that wall detail exactly the same way. So that at least it's what we try to do, okay? We try to listen and then think, stop and think, uh, what, and try and get alignment, not just what we do, but how we do it. It needs to align with the why and I, you know, I didn't emphasize it, but that purpose of that pyramid that I showed, the bottom layer of that, that particular pyramid was called who? Core values, relationships, uh, what's your story? So I, you know, when I plant a flag, in, in other words, when we come up with a design, I wanted to meet the clients. Yeah, we need to meet the building code, but we also want to align with their core values. More and more, it's not just a roof. This is a roof that has to align with that company's core values. As we see increasing emphasis on sustainability, safety, the insurance world is completely changing. It's like there's dynamics out there. It's not just a roof. We've got to align. Actually, on that very subject, how do you get to the bullseye when there are so many uh, inputs coming in from different areas and people. Yeah, it, it's a, call it a, you have to synthesize it down. Uh, you know, so you listen to the, um, the perspectives from various vantage points. You know, and I had, I had a client that really put me in an interesting situation. I showed them that hex, hex, hexagon model. And safety was one leg of the hexagon. And he said, Ron, your model implies that all pieces are equal. And in our case, they're not. Safety is more important than anything else. So I said, okay, we're gonna redraw it. <laughs> we're gonna put safety at the middle of it. And then actually they had a sustainability objective that moved into the, into the model because they had really high goals for power production. They they want, even though I'm not, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of solar on roof systems. That's a separate webinar, by the way. But uh, it's like, but they did, and so it's like, by golly, I'll help them do it the best they can. So you gotta you gotta really um, ultimately take input, and maybe even within a company, their safety team may have input, their compliance and insurance team might have input, their procurement team might have input, their engineering and user. Um, who's going to use this roof? They may have preference. So you consolidate it down. You try, you put it in writing. Here's our understanding of it. Here's what we suggest based on what we heard. What do you think? 
did we hit the bullseye? Because if you didn't, you go back to the drawing board. And that kind of leads into how it can overall cut the cost, right? Because if you have everybody's input in up front and the initial stakeholders, everybody was included in it up front, then overall the project is going to hit the target and not need changes or things down the line. Yeah, because I, you know, that line graph that I showed, our ability to impact the success of the project, or likewise, you could you could insert cost there. Our ability to impact pro the cost of the project goes down over time. So we've got to be cost conscious. Economics matter. We can't just you know design gold plated roofs. No, economics matter. So, but the earlier you get this dialed in the less likely you're gonna have costly changes later. So getting to the bullseye is an iterative process. And the closer you get to execution, um, you have to continue to work on it, okay? And I, I commonly tell people that our, this specification, it's, it's my attempt at perfection, but I've never got one perfect yet. You know, it's like, so we got to constantly be refining, dialing in our sites, because lo and behold, you tear open that roof, you find something you didn't know. Uh, but hopefully you're prepared for that. You've got economic triggers in place for that. But it, it's early and we're not caught, you know, totally surprised and subject to expensive change. All right. Uh, looks like all the questions. So if you want to go ahead and wrap it up, we're almost at the hour. Well, again, I, I do want to um, re-extend that invite for all of you that uh, hung in here with this uh, webinar. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts, whether you think it's on track or not. You know, that's an EOS term, on track or off track. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. We know we've got work to do on this. We know we've got steps to take and uh, we can have more sessions on this. But I just want you to know we're going to be working on it. All right. We're going to be working on it because we want what do we want? You know, we want relationships. We want results. And we want um, at the end of the day, um, I emphasized a lot the client's objectives. But we we try and take the same approach when it comes to relationships. We want, you know, roofing contractors, the roofing manufacturers, anybody call them stakeholders or anybody involved in the project, man, I hope to earn their respect and their trust because we're going to do it again next time and next time and another time. So, um, and hopefully we, we learn as we go and uh, keep developing that relationship. That's really key. So I hope you trust, not with your knee surgery, but I hope you, you know, place your trust in benchmark if you have a chance. And we would look forward to continuing this conversation, answering any questions you have at any time. Thank you.